GTFO. Oh, yeah. And we start with prime time. Deion Sanders. Pretty self-explanatory, too. Just GTFO. Yeah. Uh, you know so, what that means. You uh, know. He's facing criticism because he's a football coach. And, and his team is losing. That's right. And he's, he's known for doing this, and he can continue to do so. But the perception is going to be that we're attacking the message he's sending here from not the podium, but the Colorado pulpit. So it's going to always be questioned, but we deserve it. When you, when you lose, you're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be prosecuted and persecuted, and I'm good. I've been on the cross for a long time, and I'm still hanging. Still hanging. Um, look, still hanging out on that cross. I don't know how this ends up. But it is such a mess that I can't compare it to last year. You know, they, end, they, they win and they get all this moment. Now they start the season with the losses and not the, not the ridicule, but Dion would say the persecution is coming at him where if you persecute, you're not allowed to ask questions at a press conference. Um, thankfully, he took Trey's question at the end after Trey said he was holding his hand up for a question for 10 minutes and the uh, SID wouldn't look his way or wouldn't take the question. Nonetheless, I, I also see the, the predictions, uh, the discussion, the possibilities that this is his last year at Colorado because the Dallas Cowboys are going to come calling. You want to talk about criticism for being a head coach. Like they're, they're trying to compare uh, what, what would happen with Dion and oh, Shador gosh. and, oh, there's only a handful of teams he's going to play for. Don't worry about that. And you, there is no way, if you can't handle the criticism that's simply taking a one-win Colorado team to four wins and then taking that team to simply get to a bowl game, you can't handle that to, uh, to now try to play the, the martyr. Got some issues there because he's getting a ton of praise because that's all that is allowed within the, the confines of, of, of his atmosphere. And now it's, you know, he's hanging on the cross. Deion Sanders coming to you live from Golgotha, apparently, uh, with him hanging out on the cross. Hutton, here's what I will say about Dion in a positive way, believe it or not, okay? We're, we're, we're GTFOing for a number of things here. But I do think Dion <laughs> sometimes is at his best when they're losing. Can, by the way, can we refer to the media room for Dion as Golgotha moving yes, forward? Yes, Golgotha. We head to Golgotha. Right, yes. Uh, we're coming to you live from Golgotha. Uh, Dion Sanders <laughs> still hanging out on the cross. Um, <laughs> Dion, it's sometimes uh, he spits the most truth when they're losing. Like, we've yeah, seen it. You I mean, know, he'll call it what it is, post game and everything else. So I don't mind a lot of this. And here's the latest example. Trey Wallace has this story up at OutKick. Okay. Colorado staffer is alleging that a racial slur was hurled at the Colorado team and coaches following the loss to Nebraska. Okay? Yep. Now, this is from Corey Phillips, one of the staffers, and he posted, losing is one thing. The use of the N-word towards our staff and kids ain't a good look. Please be lucky. My father told me to prepare myself and not to respond. My man, that let the word come flying out of your mouth. May God cover your troubled heart. I still believe in this team. And that, okay? uh, Corey Phillips is the Colorado director of player personnel. Thank you. So I don't know if it was said or not. No idea. He could be telling the truth. Uh, who knows about it, right? Deion Sanders doesn't even know either, and he's at least admitting that. So unlike Tyree Kill, who totally leaned into the racism storyline and is now going to be the man that unites all races and cops and civilians together, Deion Sanders was asked about it, and he said, Oh, Lord, alleged, what was that? you got to understand, whoever reported it, was it one of our guys? I don't know what was said. If they said it happened, when you guys say it happened, does it mean it happened? He jokingly responded, I don't know anything about a racist. I try to stay out of the race stuff. I don't like to play that card until I'm dealt that hand profoundly in front of others. So That was from Deion Sanders. Well said. That's well said. But, but well here's said the, by him. But, uh, again... Uh, it is well said. I'm glad he said it. But he doesn't have to play that card because others play it for him. Yep. He plays the, his faith, and then you have others playing the mental health card for him and the race card for him nationally. Even though he said, you know, going back to the columnist 
who's not allowed from the from the Denver Post, who's not allowed in the for challenging his faith is what he right. But you then know. you have other media members, you know, By adding, the way, adding in other allegations. He's I mean, not said that publicly. He's only told that to Mark Jones in a production meeting. Right. Right. Because Mark Jones said that during their first game. Hey, I've not heard him publicly state that anywhere else and has not been asked about it. Yep. Um, publicly, Shadur Sanders. Now, this is a guy that can definitely GTFO. Publicly, Shadur Sanders, after the performance against Nebraska, wants everyone to know it's the issues with the offensive line as to why the offense sucked. I mean, how many times did Riley get touched? So what? How many times did Riley get touched? They was the able, like, points. of course, of course, whenever you're able to run the ball consistently, and whenever you're able to, then that opens up the pass, you know. But it's just like you got to understand, like, what, what what your team good at. So it's like, why would we keep running the ball if okay, we are we out there, and we get in a situation where it's a must get and we don't get it. Right. Are those so, like kind of like fourth and one conversions that haven't gone you guys' way in the last couple? Of, is that kind of? play into everybody's mind? Is that kind of something on your mind thinking about, you know, advancing the ball and whatnot? No, nah, I'd rather, if, if we're going to go down, I'd rather go down swinging, honestly, because I know I could throw the best punch. Chad, I don't know of a quarterback who won't take the fall, no matter the situation, that ends up having success. Like, Throwing your offensive line under the bus. It's, uh, Zach Wilson went through this with the New York Jets. Doesn't work out very well for the quarterbacks after that. Now, this is an issue that goes back last year. Shadur Sanders is under duress all the time to the point where we sit here going, how does he, how's he going to survive the season? How's he not going to end up on the injury report? He left this game early to get checked out, apparently. Um, not early because of the scoreboard. But... Overall point, no matter what, the quarterback, the leader, the captain takes the blame. And immediately after the game, it's how much did Rayleigh get touched? Well, oh, come on. It's also, you're right, Hutton. I mean, this never works out well. Never works out well for the quarterback when you start doing this publicly. But okay, hang on. About let, your let offensive me add one line. Thing. It's coming from a quarterback who told us that the guy who transferred, he didn't even know who he was. Right. He's also got a brand new offensive line. The offensive line yep. sucked last year, so Dion went wholesale and said, "All right, you're all out. Let's go find some other guys and try to piece them together and let them gel quickly as a unit." What's Jordan Seaton thinking right now? The guy was the number one player in America and top offensive tackle, and he chose Colorado over Tennessee and Ohio State. And he's getting called out by Shador Sanders. He's starting yeah. at left tackle as a true freshman. He's a great talent. Two games in, he's getting called out by his quarterback. These things don't tend to end well, and it just leads me to believe, like I said yesterday, this is a program built on sand, and Deion's not here for the long haul. I don't see Deion Sanders really embracing a lot of Colorado football stuff. It's more about Deion and his kids. I just, the longer that goes, the more I think he's not going to be here maybe past this season. Yeah, I, I, I do believe him when he says he, he loves coaching. But we've I never we've never seen Dion coach a team without one of his kids playing on that team. Yeah, and it's got to be on, on his terms. Right. I don't think he loves coaching so much that he just has to go out. You know, we've seen coaches who lose a job, but, you, boy, you know they love ball because they're willing to go do this. Right. NFL coaches who go coach in high school. Yeah. Right. Connor Stallions wants to coach. Yeah. He That's wants to clear. Coach. He, right. He loves. To... He loves ball. He can't get enough of yeah. it. He's obsessed with football. Connor Stallions claims that he's talked to Michigan people recently that tell him he's got a chance to coach at Michigan later. I think Deion Sanders <laughs> likes coaching. Yeah. I think he loves. But that. I think he'll only do it under his own terms. And he's already said, you know, was it last year? NFL's not for him. But maybe Colorado's not for him either. Based on I, I, hey, look, I can side with Dion on this. You know, I, I too am a coach, Dion, and yeah. uh, I like coaching. Would you but coach? I'm not going to coach a team that my daughter's not on. So I'm not in a hurry to de dedicate that time to do it. So as much as I like ball and I like coaching softball, I don't think I'm going to be in it forever, and I don't think that I'm going to coach a team that my kid's not on. So much like we're kind of the same, Hutton.
we're, we're really similar. Uh, you and Dion. Me and Dion, just up here on Golgotha together, <laughs> hanging out. We're hanging to the pool. Just we're, hanging out. We're headed to the pulpit in Golgotha. Hanging out. Yes. Uh, final for uh, GTFO, uh, Cleveland Browns Sports Radio. Uh, let's just. Oh, yes. That's all the setup we need. When did you find out that you were going to be starting? When did I find out? Oh, this is Jordan Mason. Maybe Friday, Friday night, you know, something like that. I was always, always prepared. I mean, Oh, there's this Jordan Mason. We'll get to it in a moment. Uh, so Jordan Mason was asked when he found out that he was starting and yeah. Christian McCaffrey was out, and he said Friday night. Well, okay, Let, let's let's dive into this. So he says Friday night. That's right after the broadcast that, on the field. Yeah. He, by the way, Jordan Mason from right down the road here, Gallatin uh, High School. I, I covered Wallet. him at Gallatin with the Green Wave when I was covering high school football. Interviewed him while he was in high school. So he says he found out Friday night. Cool to see him I've have got, so much I've success. Got, uh, a plausible explana- explanation they should use, even though it's probably not true. Here is Kyle Shanahan. And this is the explanation. Ex- explaining that Jordan Mason was not told by him on Friday that he would be starting. Kyle, Jordan said after the game he was told on Friday night he was going to start. When did Christian start feeling awry? I never told Jordan he was going to start. Um, told me he had to be ready a bunch, but I might have been Bobby or somebody trying to pump him up, but uh, I knew he was going to have to play a lot. Uh, I told him that he was going to have to, it wasn't going to be like usual. Uh, he was going to be a number two back that was splitting a lot of the time. Um, but now he didn't know he for sure was doing that till today. Did Christian have some sort of a setback on Friday? Is that- no, he didn't have a setback. I mean, it was, it was on and off throughout the week. He was able to practice throughout the week, just... Um, it was always bothering him to a degree, and um, sometimes it goes away, sometimes it comes back, and uh, today it was bothering him a little too much to where we didn't feel good about it. Okay, so that then leads to Jordan Mason coming to the podium and being asked about this again <laughs> after he's already discussed. He was, he was briefed. Uh, after, well, after he's already discussed on the sideline that he was told on Friday. When did you find out that you'd be in the starting lineup? That question right there is is why I'm at. Uh, that's why I don't like really talking to media because you say one thing wrong and then, you know, I don't know. Just skip that question. So I, I, I feel bad for him. I do. Because he got in trouble. Yeah, well, if potentially he ends up hurting his team with a uh, penalty uh, from the NFL for not disclosing the, the injury. Here, to me, is the plausible explanation. Christian McCaffrey told me on Friday. He told me Friday night. Well, would that be... No. That would be legal? Yeah, maybe he didn't feel like he was going to play, get ready to start. But here's the other thing. If you're Kyle Shanahan, I I mean, this is how I would think. I'm going to tell Jordan Mason he's starting. I'm also telling him, keep this quiet. We don't want the Jets focused on any other position until right before kickoff that he's inactive. Well, so it, they can't, they, they, the game plan's in, all that. We're not going to let this get out. If I'm Jordan Mason, I'm telling everybody I'm well, starting the, the on Friday night. The explanation is exactly what Kyle Shanahan said. I thought he handled that beautifully. Well, His poker face, but, when they're asking the question and he's being told that Jordan Mason said that, he, that they did something illegal, he does not break his face at all. And he goes, I, I didn't tell him that. He said someone may have right. told him that to try to pump him up, but we're just talking about him being ready to play. That's it. Jordan Mason could just say, I misspoke. They were telling me all week and on Friday, like, hey, you really need to be ready on Sunday because you might get more carries. If it's a oh, yeah. he said, he said situation, I don't see it going anywhere. Well, I, I, but also... Um, I don't think Jordan Mason handled the second part of that well. I, I also feel bad for him in that spot, but... They had time clearly to get on to him about that and be sure. angry about oh, it. No doubt. They need to tell him, here's what you need to say. This is how you can explain it away about what's going but on. But if, if they told him he was starting, there would be some explanation prior to that. Hey, don't, don't tweet this, whatever. Like, you know, you, because you want your family there, right? You're yeah. starting the NFL game, and then you go out and ball out, and you know this going into the game. Again, uh, that's how I would assume it would be handled. Now, the reason why this rule is in place is for the gambling and wagering aspect of it. And in looking on, and, and I'm looking for uh, Todd Furman's text to me, um, and then he got on social media. Here it is. So you have someone that went after Todd 
say, he said, Jordan Mason telling Salters that he found out on Friday night that he was going to start is absolutely incredible. Everyone was stunned by this right before, when, an hour and a half before the game last night. Colby, this guy Colby, responds to Furman and says, I bet Vegas knew since Friday too. And Todd says, I'm sure they wish they did, but can, can assure you they didn't. I have that intel. And then more people come at it. And, and say, Are you 100% sure? How do you know? He goes, yes. He goes, I'm not 100% sure. I'm actually 1,000% sure because Jordan Mason props were widely available at 11 and a half yards over under over the last two days. So how does the NFL handle this versus how they handled the B. John Robinson situation in Atlanta last year? where he gets one carry, two carries right at the end of a game when they put him in after not playing him the entire game. Well, I, here's one way that this could get really sticky for them and, and for a number of reasons, is if there's a Jonte Porter type situation that a family member or someone close Puts to Jordan Mason won a ton of money on it, on over the carries. If someone I, placed a bet Friday night yeah. that's closely related to Jordan Mason in any way, that's then they'd want a ton of money. But, there's going to be a sports book that has a red flag on I that. I think we know by now. Yep. With all the discussion. Maybe not, but I, I think we know. And I think that also, I'm not saying Mason would have anything to do with it. Because who's to say that a family member doesn't tell a friend who then goes and does that, right? There's a, you would expect that to happen in this day and age with that intel. Again, 11 and a half yards is, uh, it's low over under.